something that is present in Nehemiah is Artaxerxes, which is basically the stepson of Esther, but perhaps it enlightened Artaxerxes to have a little bit more kinder heart towards the Jews. Now, Nehemiah himself was a cupbearer for the king, so he had worked himself up into that position, and that would be like being the chief of staff for the U.S. president. It's somebody that you didn't have access to the president until you talked to this person first, or they created the schedule. And not only was he the wine taster for the king to make sure things weren't poisoned, he was also the individual that tasted the king's food. So this is a position, I'm going to call it one and done. If something was poisoned, your job was done, right? If you died, then you did your task. But it was so, there was so much stuff going on with these rulers and poisonings and coups and um, that's why they did that. So he didn't have access to the king, and that's why Nehemiah became a very close confidant of the king. And so they spent a lot of time together because, uh, you know, obviously, whatever they did, eat two, three times a day, maybe more. I'm sure he drank wine more than twice, three times a day. So Nehemiah was in the presence of Artaxerxes quite often. Now, see, the book of Ezra picks up the thread about 70 years after 2 Chronicles. Uh, 70 year captivity is over, and the part of the remnant, the Jewish population, returns to the land of Israel. And under Ezra, it takes about 50 years after Zerubbabel. Then Nehemiah goes back 15 years after Ezra. But let us read the text. We'll read the whole chapter here, then we'll, we'll break it down. In verse 1, chapter 1 of Nehemiah, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was at Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came to the men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe in your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. How this applies to us is that we have things in our own lives that we need to take care of. We need to rebuild our own walls, not to keep people out, just to make sure that our structure, our lives are in good shape for the work that God has before us. And so I think of, especially with chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Nehemiah, that was the most poignant topic, I think, that, that came out of the text. So whether right now, talking about rebuilding yourself, rebuilding your Christian walk, and judging from a lot of you here today is that you, you probably don't need to hear this, but it's probably good to put in your, your equipment case or something to refer back to um, as you are out there, because sometimes we get very discouraged as Christians. We see things, we see the destroyed walls in our lives. We see the destroyed walls of people that we run into 
and right now, we're being in a political climate that we are, we're seeing a lot of uh, destruction of one another. We're seeing people that don't care. When I look at social service organizations, for example, there are a lot of corporations that have money, but yet they don't, don't give to the poor. And that, that forms me where a large automotive manufacturer will slow down production just to keep their, their costs elevated because it's all about supply and demand. If, if the supply is not there, they keep their prices high, and they purposefully do that. And so you'll see that around Jerusalem, there is this intermingling of many nations. And so when Nehemiah was trying to build this wall, and mind you, this is in what, 500 B.C. We didn't have cranes. We didn't have scaffoldings like we have today. We didn't have laser levels and uh, transits and things that we use in modern building to, to do this. But Nehemiah gets in there and he built that wall with the help of his compatriots 52 days. And that's an amazing feat if you want to think about a fortress wall. Now, I've been to a number of prisons, not as an inmate, but in my former career, <laughs> especially in the South Southwest Michigan prison in Jackson, which is one of the older, older facilities in the state, how thick those walls were. And that's cement. That's a matter of just backing up a concrete truck and pouring it in. But these are rocks. These are stones that they're actually uh, hammering out and chiseling to make fit. And you have to think, the prison wall itself is six, six feet thick. So if you're sitting there with a plastic knife from your commissary or from your food that came through, it's going to take you a while to whittle through six feet of concrete. Um, but here are these stones, and you just imagine the feats of the ancient Egypts when they're trying to build these pyramids at Giza, just how much fantastic strength of manpower that took. And there's different theories on how they did it, but just an amazing feat. So Nehemiah gets there, and he has the power of God to build these walls. And it's just amazing to think that it takes 52 days to put a wall all the way around Jerusalem. Because what Ezra did before was he got in there, he was able to build the temple. You remember we're talking about uh, Haggai, the, the prophet, so you guys need to get off your, your backsides here and build a temple. And he succeeded in, in doing that, encouraging the people to do that. But this is some time after. So the temple's built. You got some people in there running in and out. But Jerusalem itself as a city was still susceptible to invasion. They were susceptible to a number of things. And that was part of the problem, is that here you have, you're my chosen people, but then there were the tribes that were intermingling, there were having children with their enemy, marrying foreign wives. And this is what caused God to be upset with them. It's just like it says in Deuteronomy. Moses said this to the nation. It's like, look, if you abide by, my, by the Lord's words, by the word of God, you follow my commandments, you do what you're supposed to do, I will be with you. But as soon as they turned their back on God, he fulfilled his promise because you're going into captivity. You saw it in Daniel. Remember the, the bad king in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar? And so we go through that entire thing of anti-Semitism with Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to make an example out of them. So he throws them in a fiery furnace. But you know, when they looked in that furnace, there were four people standing there. And some speculate that it was Christ himself. I was in that fire with him to protect those men. But that's the good ones that were coming out of captivity. So Nehemiah comes through here, and then, as we talked about, this is, uh, he doesn't really approach the king about going into Jerusalem until four months after he talks to Hanani. And so he's trying to evaluate what to say. I remember when I was a kid, my dad wasn't a very nice guy. Um, and it would always seem like it was some drama or some angry reaction when you talk to the guy. And so basically, my, my sister and I, 
were very scared of this dude. Um, and I remember I had to ask my dad to go over to my friend's house or something like that. And that's my mom would always, oh, yes, yeah, your dad. Oh, do I got him? Can you just say yeah? <laughs> so I remember standing, I'm just, because he'd sit in the living room, he'd watch TV, and I remember, I, was, I didn't like being around him, so I, I was kind of like in the kitchen just pacing back and forth. Like, man, I want to go over to my friend's house, but I don't really want to ask Dad, but I'm going to miss out on a good time if I don't go. Uh, so it's just that constantly going back and forth, like, do I do it? Trying to get the courage enough to go confront this guy. Hey, can I go over to my friend's house? But Nehemiah's kind of doing that same thing. He's waited four months before he goes to the king to ask anything personal. He's got to be very careful, right? He's got a job to do. He has a lot of responsibility as being the cupbearer. But he wanted to make sure that God gave him the right word. He needed to seek God first about his prayer on what to do. And if you, you look at, uh, like in verse 5, analyzing Nehemiah's prayer, he's talking about, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. You see that in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He's giving praise to the Almighty. And Nehemiah does this back in the Old Testament. He knows the pecking order, that we are lowly people, we are servants, and like you are the most awesome God. You keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. So he's acknowledging, maybe reminding God. He doesn't need a reminder, but in his heart. But God, remember you take care of the good ones. Please be, let your beard, excuse me, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. So when Nehemiah learns of the status and condition of Jerusalem, he he wept. He prayed. He mourned. And so we will look at those things that we have going on in our own life. What do we need to do when we go before God? We need, we need to pray. And there was a really good quote. I hope I could get it right. Right now in our, our country, in our world, we pray without tears. We give without sacrifice. And we sow or reap without sowing. It is a couple of things there. You know, we, we pray without tears. And how many of you just go through the motions? It's like you have your little uh, daily bread thing, your little 10 minute devotion that you do in the morning. And it's great that you're doing it if you are. But how much attention are you putting, putting to God? How much attention are you putting to your prayers that you get beyond your own sphere for prayer? And folks, we have an election coming up and a lot of lives are going to be impacted because of this. How many times have you prayed for our nation? How many times have you prayed for our governmental leadership, for our judges? And there are, there are a lot of things to pray about. We could pray for Israel, who are still at war. We have a Palestinian presence in the United States of America, and right now it's kind of died off a little bit, but they're still protesting. I was in Kalamazoo just two weeks ago, and I saw people, probably four or five, standing on a corner talking about the war of Israel and Palestine. So, kind of losing my train of thought on that, but <laughs> you see where we need to pray. And those matters that we need to pray about need to be heartfelt. Not just as the rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub before you dig in at dinner time. 
that was always a joke at family dinners. You know, rub dub dub face and grub. And again, that's that was all the thanks that they gave to God. But you look at Jesus Christ in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying so hard to the point where he bled. And I can tell you personally, I've never done that. I'd be a little concerned. <laughs> but when you have a big thing that you need to do or something that you are facing in your life, we really need to present that to God and pray. So Nehemiah does this. Okay, I have to confront the king. I have to ask him to do this thing for Jerusalem. And he just takes his, uh, his time to reflect. God, you are great. You're almighty. Remember us, your servants. And he even takes the responsibility for his nation. I don't know how many people do that and want to take responsibility for something somebody else did. But Nehemiah is like, forgive my fathers, forgive my country, forgive me, forgive anything that I've done against you. We've not kept your commandments. And we see through the Old Testament when you look at Deuteronomy in Leviticus, how all these, these laws were set in place basically for atonement. It's like, okay, well, you did this many sins, so you have to sacrifice this many birds, you have to do a, this many sacrifices. And it was, it was laid out pretty extensively in the Old Testament. But I just want you to remember that we, we are not bound by that. We're in the New Covenant. Jesus Christ died for our sins, and um, that basically was our sacrificial lamb. We just need to ask for forgiveness from, from Christ when we're, we're messing up. So... Back to the point about praying without crying. Just whatever it is you have going on in your life, you're praying about, whether it is a could be a medical diagnosis, it could be a job, could be future plans that you have, but pray about it. Bring it before the Lord. Just don't uh, assume and be, a, I call it being a bobber on Yosh and just letting the currents take you wherever it may go. You know, prayer changes things, folks, and that's ever-present in, in Scripture that you bring things before God. He's going to listen to you. You might not get the answer that you want, but he's listening. And another thing that uh, the quote was about uh, giving without sacrifice. And I look at being called to ministry, for example. It's like, if God's asking you to crawl to China or to minister in Zimbabwe, it's like, oh, no, that is a third world country? I'm not going. But you have raw sewage in the streets or you don't know where the food's coming from. You can't, just can't run down to the supermercado to get your, your dinner for the evening. It's a whole different life, but we, we're so used to our creature comforts here in the United States that maybe some of us are a little bit fearful of that. But sometimes you're going to have that calling, and you're not going to rest until you fulfill that calling. But giving without sacrifice, and then Jesus talks about this as well. You know, about the, the woman that gives her perfume, and it was... Uh, oh, man, we could have taken that. I think it was Judas that said that. Why, why are you, we could have taken that and given it to the poor. We could have sold it off. We could have done all this. Yeah, but I'm only with you for a temporary time, for a little bit. So that was a worthy thing to do. And we see it often where, I guess we call it per capita, you know, the, based on your income. Well, 40% of $100,000 is a lot more financially than 40% of $20,000. Right, but when we look at St. Joseph County itself, there was a thing. In, this is about ten years ago, maybe longer. But there was a write-up in the Kalamazoo Gazette talking about our county, where we are, how it's one of the more depressed counties in the state of Michigan. Like we lead lead the state in births out of wedlock. We lead the the state in the number of people that are actually on some type of aid. And we lead the county in 
or in the, in the state on a number of methamphetamine arrests. Um, it's just amazing. And I had told one former, uh, actually a friend of mine is a preacher, a missionary, he's like, yeah, if you knew what was going on, you'd be afraid to go out of your door. And I'm talking to some parole agent friends that are still working. I was like, yeah, it's nuts. Basically, you have to sit at home, sit on top of your stuff with a gun, keep people from breaking in. Because the judges are in this reformative justice thing where we don't want to have any consequences because they're misunderstood. Oh, they're an addict. Well, that's okay. We'll get you some treatment, and we won't penalize you for stealing things, or we won't penalize you for you know, maybe growing up in a single mom or single parent household. But we have to evaluate where we are as Christians and that, like I said, how we need to pray about those types of changes. Sometimes it's said that we need to take a responsibility. It's our fault for how things are. Maybe to a certain extent because we had a certain level of tolerance. Like I don't want to get involved. And you see, oh, maybe I'll register to vote now. I heard it from a friend of mine growing up. It's like, ah, voting doesn't make a difference. Well, it does when you start getting down to, you know, the hundreds and tens and twenties when you're in an election. Tens of thousands, maybe not so much, but it does make a difference. So I'm not on a political tirade this morning, but I want to encourage you to participate in that government because the Christian voices need to be heard. Christian voices need to be and our morals need to be supported by the people that are making those laws. And that's where it starts. But we have to have an active prayer life. We have to be able to give. I think one of the more interesting things about Israel Is it constantly? Is your you go from Genesis to Exodus? What happens in Exodus? The Israel Jews are in captivity, right? They're in captivity in Egypt. So Abraham or Moses said, "You don't keep my commandments, you will go into captivity." Then we see it again in Nebuchadnezzar. Then we have King Cyrus, who is part of the Babylonian Empire. And so he's going to captivity there. And I've already referenced Daniel. But Daniel writes his prophecy about things that have. He actually prophesied that Nehemiah, not him specifically, but the wall of Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt. And there it is. And I think we also look at the Lord's Prayer for what Nehemiah is addressing here. He's, he's talking about, he praises God, he gives homage to God, and he, he's grateful for what he has, but then he makes his requests known. And then, even in the Lord's Prayer, is kind of like the template when we need to pray. It tells us what we need to be looking after. And it says, I, I pray, and this is the last Last verse of uh, chapter 1. So I pray and grant him mercy from the sight of this man. So he's actually specifically talking about going to the king <clears throat> for as a king's cupbearer. So there he wanted to address, have the words to say, just like maybe as a little kid trying, oh, all right, I got to my dad. I did ask him, then he said no. But <laughs> I was like, no, no. But nonetheless, we look at rebuilding our walls, rebuilding our lives. Nehemiah gives us a really good thing to, to seek. Read ahead, because we're going to be in this book for the next two weeks, even after this morning. So do that, read ahead. Chapter 3, it gets a little wonky because it talks about more heritage type things, but we'll still plow through that. Because what chapter 3 does, it starts talking about the people that are mocking 
Nehemiah for what he's doing. And how many times in our lives, and I got stories upon stories of, oh, do you believe in that stuff? You know, I've had my own family members that grew up in the church, but all of a sudden they get blocked by science, and all of a sudden they, they've, they're in the know. They, they know all the science data. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> Earth's 6,000 years old. Yeah, right. It's a form of mockery. And we have these Samaritans or Samaritans that are hanging around the walls in Jerusalem or city of Jerusalem picking on Nehemiah for that same thing. Do they really believe that stuff? Do they go, oh, yeah, right. But I can't imagine the, the amount of times. And fortunately, because I'm bigger, people don't pick on me too much. But... <laughs> He's like, oh, Jesus freak, Jesus freak. And we sang songs about it being a Jesus freak. That was a song by D.C. Talk. Yeah. But I'm not ashamed of it. And so wherever you are in your status of rebuilding your, your walls or getting your, your life back together, that uh, let's look at Nehemiah, look at what he's doing. Uh, he wasn't discouraged by the people that were mocking him or the naysayers. And when he's actually, when he does confront the king or ask the king for a reprieve so he can go take care of the walls of Jerusalem, he's very careful not to mention the city of Jerusalem. He dances around and saying, I need to go where my ancestors are buried. And you look through that whole text, he, he never mentions Jerusalem by name. But our exertions has to know, like, oh, this guy's a Jew, he's probably from that area. Puts two and two together, and Nehemiah was able to negotiate. Well, if you would, give me a written decree. And he's got his little uh, voucher, if you will, to go to the forest of the king to get timbers for helping to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So the hand of God was upon his efforts there. But we'll dig into that heavier next week. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, go ahead and close out service. I don't, I'm not going to go an hour, <laughs> but um, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer and where you're sitting right now. Uh, just focus on yourself and think about things that you have going on in your personal life, things that you need to rebuild, restructure, things that you need to confront. Whether you're struggling with certain sins in your life. Or if there are certain things, family members that are antagonizing you, uh, your relationships are broken, maybe there is some animosity that you have with friends or family, you need to rebuild those relationships. I'm going to ask this morning that you put those before God. Because it's often said that if you don't take care of you, you're not much good to anybody else. But you need to really hone, sharpen your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and work on those things. Because it affects everything around you. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, just give you thanks and praise for the day, Lord. I thank you for the words that you have transcribed in the book of Nehemiah to encourage us, Lord, and no matter what we have before us and how daunting the task may be, but if you're in it, you will provide, you will guide. And Father God, I just uh, if there's somebody here this morning that doesn't know you and has not made that decision to follow you, I pray that today will be the day. It's a very simple prayer. Just, it's not even really a sinner's prayer. Just acknowledge that you're a sinner. And Jesus Christ died on that cross for your sins. And accept Jesus Christ into your heart. And Lord God, I just uh, ask you to be each and every person here this morning that... Uh, whether they have rebuilding to do, but just, again, work in that.
We ask for your guidance and direction. Lord, be with this church here in this community. Let us be a light. Let us be impactful of those that we interact with. And we ask for a great week, Father God, and just give us the opportunity to, to share your word. We ask all these things in your precious and most holy name. Amen. All right, folks, you're dismissed. But if you...